And then last week, Psalm 9, this had more international enemies causing um, collective trouble for Israel. So that's broader. So, but today we're sort of focusing back in tighter to the struggles of an individual. So we're in Psalm 10 and we're back looking at one man's battle against his enemies. And while we're not exactly sure who wrote it, because this one doesn't have a title, which most have had titles so far, but it's still likely a Psalm of David for two reasons. One, that it's buried amongst a whole pile of Psalms that are clearly to, from David, by David. And two, it would seem to suit David's life quite well again, most likely in reference to the trouble King Saul was causing him. And since Saul was God's anointed king, there was little that his conscience would allow him to do to fight back. And, you know, he can't touch the Lord's anointed and all that. So that uh, left him just looking at the evil that Saul was committing in his regime and going, well, what, what do I do? And so we'll therefore assume that David wrote it. I will today, so I'll speak to that way, as, the, as if David wrote it, but just be aware it, there is some chance he may not have. But. So with no one left to turn to now, David, in this psalm, he is just left with God. That, and so it's just God's ear. That's all he had to, to call upon. But when we find then, what we find then is a man who's trying trying that he's trying to get God to act to rectify things but nothing seems to be happening seems like God's ignoring him so that's why we read he says where are you Lord you know so do you ever feel like that pretty much everyone does it sometime or another so don't feel alone ironically you don't feel like you're by yourself being by yourself uh, and of course that's one of the reasons why God included this psalm in our Bibles, it shows us that even the biblical writers had fear sometimes. And God would rather that we ask the question of him than piously and dishonestly pretending everything is right between you and God. If, if you have this feeling, express it. So that's why Psalms are so comforting, isn't it? Because they're so real. It's not whitewashing the situation and hiding your feelings. So what you see is what you get, and that's what God wants. But you notice David never acted without faith. So he trusted God. And even when he had questions about how God was doing things in his, in his apparent absence, so even in those times he still trusted God. And, and that's the balance we need to strike, that honesty, expressing our concerns, but faith as well in that, the answer is always with God and you know that. And the other encouraging thing about this psalm, like many of them, is that it takes you on a bit of a journey where the origin is questioning, so this starts out with that question, but the destination at the end is great encouraging truths about God. So we'll see a bit of that journey as we go today and I think that's a bit of a picture in itself of where our trouble should lead us. Because David was in trouble, so he had that question, then he got to the end and he was in a better place, and at least emotionally and, and spiritually. So in the same way, I think trouble should help us to question and reevaluate. And if we do that by faith and, and truly seek God, then we will grow and have greater faith in the end. So that's kind of that picture in this psalm as well. Okay, so how does that journey look? At least for David here. So we have those initial questions. So David is now looking at his enemies after he has those questions and he notices four main characteristics of these unfaithful people. And they're spread over ten verses. And they do tend to, so they, but they do tend to clump into sort of four main sections. So that's how we're going to address it. And then in the end he pretty much addresses each of those bad characteristics with something about God and his ways and his person. Which answer those character problems. So that's kind of how it's set out. So... Rather than going fully sequentially through the psalm today, we'll bring the questions and answers together so, and deal with them more in their theme. So it's not going to be quite as sequential as normal. Shock horror. Still largely sequential. So hopefully, anyway, the way we do that, hopefully it'll make better sense of things for us. But first we need the opening question because that sets the tone for what's going to follow. So verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? 
So from where the psalmist is standing, he can see lots of apparently successful enemies who are rejecting God and doing pretty well, he thinks, but he, he can't see God. So you know, they're doing great. I'm not doing so well. What's going on with that? God's not here. So I can't see him. Lord, are you hiding? You're holy and perfect, so how can you let evil run rampant? That doesn't seem consistent. I can't get that in my head. And isn't that the question so many people have today? And it's the reason a lot of them decide to reject God, because he doesn't fit what they imagine a good God would be like. But if there's one thing we learn from Scripture, it's that while God can certainly be known and loved, his ways are far beyond what we can comprehend. Which is exactly what God says when he compares him, uh, humans and himself in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. This, you'll know this passage. I'll bring it up for you. Isaiah 55 verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God's not bragging here. He's just telling it like it is to help us get our thinking right because this is, this is the truth. And that's really a lesson for anyone who rejects God on the grounds that they can't fully grasp the way he acts, the way, or why he acts the way he does. A lot of people do. And as we said last week, don't get too big for your boots to presume you're able to accurately judge God. So that's where that theme sort of follows through from last week. So you and I are so, so limited in our understanding. But God knows and sees all. He's omniscient and he's omni-everything. <laughs> and he's perfectly just and loving and in control. So we just have to trust him when things don't make sense to us from our perspective. We're looking from down here, but he's up there. So we, yeah, we just need to trust him. And this is what David does here which will become clearer by the end. So now we're going to look at the four main characteristics of God's enemies that David highlights in this psalm. And so we started in verse 1 with David, presumably David, as I'm saying, uh, stating his concern that he thinks God is being unnecessarily detached from the bad things that are happening. And so he now sets out to describe those bad things. This is what he sees around him going on. He's just going... Ugh. So these are the bad attitudes which lead to those bad things as well. And the first one of these we encounter is one that says, God doesn't matter. God doesn't matter. Even if he exists, he doesn't matter. So we see that in verses 2 to 4. I'll read those. So in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of, his, of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Or another way of translating that last bit is, God is not in his thoughts. So it's sort of like God is not, basically, is kind of the, the wording there. So in other words, God doesn't matter. It covers all the meaning there, kind of. Even if he exists, he's irrelevant to my life and decisions. So that's part of what it means to renounce the Lord. Just don't acknowledge him in anything you do, really. And there are a number of ways people arrive to this conclusion in life, but I'll highlight two versions of this now. So some say they used to believe in God, but through circumstances of life in which, like we mentioned before, they don't think God acted in the way they expected or wanted, perhaps. So they became disappointed and bitter, and they say, even if there is a God, why would I want to know him, let alone love him? You know, he doesn't care about me. So they fall away and don't consider his teachings in their life choices. And then some on this kind of track actually go further and call themselves atheists, saying there's no God at all. And many of these actively oppose anything that comes from him. So they target their attacks at Christianity and seek to discredit and damage it. And so this is actually one way that they can be caught in their own schemes, really. Because whether they admit it or not, they're pushing away the source of good in their lives. Because God is the only source of good. <clears throat> and over time, if enough people are uh, like this, you begin to see what we see now in our society. More, more people pushing away God, so we get increased anarchy and anger and diseases due to immorality. 
pushing away God's standards. And division, division in society and division with churches. Since each person becomes their own God, in effect, and multiple gods destroy unity. If everyone's got their own little kingdom they're ruling over, you're going to have, you know, trouble. So it goes on and on and on, all these things that come from pushing God away. So these kind of people in their self-imposed blindness and rage against the supposedly non-existent God, they consider these terrible things simply vestiges of the oppressive Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Christian worldview. And then they redouble their efforts to eradicate it. That's the kind of thinking we see in our society, isn't it? They, they blame all this on Christians because, see, that's where it got us. It's actually the opposite. And this accelerating downward spiral is what the Bible calls God giving humanity over to their sin. Okay, so that's the effects of atheism. And it seems that these are more of the ones who have the power in today's world. From the media to politicians, to celebrities, to scientists, to artists. So these are all the kind of people who regular folks look to for direction in some kind of way or another. All of them in various forms. And the vast, vast majority of all those people are at least ignore, if not actively reject, God and Jesus. There are Christians in all those fields, but obviously the majority is not. So you get people like the philosopher and writer John Gray, who say things like this. <clears throat> what we believe doesn't in the end matter very much. What matters is how we live. Now, some people would go, yeah, that's right. What matters is that we all love each other and get along in spite of our differences. Does that sound good? Yeah. As an outcome on the very surface level, that's not an unreasonable goal. We want to get on with each other. That's fine. But the issue he ignores in that statement is that how each of us live our lives and the decision we, decisions we make are a direct and unavoidable outflow of what we believe. Your decisions come from what you believe. And those of us who are going through growth works at the moment will remember that John North spoke about how our character and our actions are simply the visible expression of our internal values and beliefs. So what we believe on the inside comes out in our actions. And the example he gave was someone's choices when shopping. Uh, if someone's circumstances and character cause them to value what's cheaper, talking about grocery shopping here, um, whatever what tastes better, then they will go with the generic brand foods, you know, the home brand, whatever, all that sort of thing. While someone else might be well off, and then their values will make them buy the better quality product because they'll be happy to spend a bit more. And it's not a bad or good thing, it's just different situations. People have different purchase patterns because they have different priorities. So there you have two different choices clearly driven, driven by two different values or beliefs if you like. Okay, So that's evidence there. Beliefs about what matters most in, in that particular field at least. And you can liken it to church as well can't you? There are many things people can value in a church whether good Bible teaching or great music or close fellowship or community interaction so which of these matter most to you will obviously inform which church you go to, if you have the option, of course. <laughs> we don't always have the option in some places, but if you do, you'll choose one that will match up with the things you value. That's just natural. So that's why like-minded people tend to gather. That's what happens. And all of this flies in the face of John Gray's assertion there that we should not worry about beliefs and just look at actions. Because, like I said, actions are simply the visible expression of your beliefs. It's kind of like him saying, hey, I want to grow a tomato. Now, it doesn't matter what I plant, as long as I get a tomato at the end of it. You understand, he's going to have to plant a tomato seed to get a tomato. You can't plant something else. In the same way, you have to have right beliefs to get right actions. So, yes, actions are the visible expressions of our beliefs. And I like the quote that which kind of applies to the, the, the national kind of level as well. This one I heard, culture, and I quoted this to the guys, culture is worldview made visible. In other words, what kinds of things a people group does are a direct result of the things they hold to be true and valuable at the deepest level. If you think about different countries, and certainly those who are based on specific different religions, think India versus the West versus 
whatever, other um, you know, Islamic countries, what they do reflects their beliefs. And that's just, you can't avoid that connection. So, yeah, John Gray's assertion is flawed on that point, that actions and beliefs are completely independent. They are not. But not just there that it's flawed. There's something even deeper that's inconsistent in that statement. Because underlying it is obviously the belief that some behaviours are better than others, right? Because he's looking at the behaviours and going, well, you know, I'm, I'm judging this behaviour. So if he wants us all to be judged only on, only on our behaviours, he must have in mind some standard by which to judge the behaviours. Which makes sense. So that begs the question, where does that standard come from? Because presumably he would say, for example, that to say help victims of an earthquake is better than commit mass murder. I think most of us would agree on that. I'd like to think so. There's a couple of people, notable exceptions to that, but um, yes, if you have no standard by which to measure the goodness of something, then who's to say that philanthropy, helping people, is better than killing? So, okay, an evolutionist might say, well, it's better for the survival of the species, obviously, if you look after people and help them get better. But why? Deaths in an earthquake are indiscriminate. A lot of healthy reproductive people might die. At least murder can be targeted at the ones who need to be exterminated for the greater good of the survival of humanity. This is just for the sake of argument. Okay, I'm not saying that, <laughs> obviously. But you get my point, hopefully. Because <laughs> some people do think like that. It's eugenics and stuff like that. And so you need to see how this is a super dangerous belief. And really, it's behind the push for open slather abort abortions and euthanasia and everything. And it demonstrates that belief is driving behaviour, isn't it? If you believe certain, certain things about the world and about people, you'll do certain things that match up with that belief. You simply can't escape that. But still, the point I'm trying to make here is that no true objective standard, there is no true objective standard if you have no belief in God. But as Christians, we have an external standard. We hold that the Bible is the standard written by the Creator, so He knows exactly how things should be done if you want true peace in the world. But if you reject God and therefore His Word, you have no standard by which to measure good and end up borrowing parts from God anyway, which is what John's doing there in this in that quote, basically. He's borrowing from morality from the Bible. So anyway, that's the folly of saying God doesn't matter. So what does the psalmist say in response to that? Well, that's found in verse 16. So if you've got your passage, you can go to verse 16. He says this, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. So the Lord, Yahweh, is king. Yahweh rules whether you accept it or not. Now that's always been the case and will always be the case forever. Now, the bit about nations perishing from his land is probably designed to bring to mind when Joshua and the nation of Israel conquered Canaan back in the days of the Exodus. So they kicked out those seven nations. Actually, they didn't do the job properly, completely, but that's another story. But again, the pattern applies more broadly in that to the Jewish mind, the nations, the nations represented what was opposed to Yahweh. And so the fullest meaning of this will be when 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 25 happens. Speaking of Jesus, Paul prophesies this. When, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And that will be an awesome day. Okay, on to the second characteristic of God's enemies. One will call, I will win. I'm the greatest, but you know, don't think of <laughs> Muhammad Ali there, but anyway, I, I will win. So here's what that, how that kind of person is described in verses 5 to 7. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. Now, we really pick up another side of his arrogance here, don't we? It's the, the last one was kind of thumbing his nose at God. 
denying him. But this one's all about him and his self-reliance and me, me, I. So it's this foolish self-reliance he's convinced himself of that everything will always be wonderful. Always the winner, never the loser. Always standing firm and victorious. And without trying to step on too many toes, this sounds a bit like the health and wealth prosperity gospel teachings which really are having a resurgence in, resurgence in recent years. Now just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with health and prosperity in themselves. But when people try and make them the main thing or the main sign of whether God approves of you or not, or worse, make it the sign of saving faith, then you've missed the point quite badly. Because for one thing, as far as health and wealth, Jesus wouldn't pass that test, would he? He owned pretty much just the clothes on his back. I don't even know if he owned them, but you know, he was itinerant, didn't have anything. He even had, you know, remember that time he had to show me an inscription, Caesar's inscription, he had to borrow a coin, he asked for a coin. So he didn't really have very much. I don't think it was just that he forgot his wallet that day. So. <laughs> so no, material prosperity is not the issue. In fact, it can be a hindrance. And it all plays into this whole attitude of selfishness. The me, me, me vibe that you get in these verses, as we just read that little bit. And what comes along with that attitude are those five things listed there in verse 7. I just want to have a look at those in slightly a little more detail. Because they're kind of attached like a trailer on a car. So if you have an arrogant and selfish attitude, at least some of these things will be behind you in the trailer, carried with you. First one's cursing. That's pronouncing or wishing evil on others, even if it's just in your mind, just thinking it, you know, or even just insulting them. This comes from a mindset that I'm more important than you, so others are dispensable, don't worry about them as long as I'm happy. And as theologian John Trapp said, such cursing men are cursed men. Next one, deceit. Deceit or deceitfulness. And this this can be really subtle, even so much that the person doesn't notice it themselves that they're being deceiving. They might deceive themselves. Because you have such a high view of yourself that you justify lies and half-truths and excuses because you just know that you are a good person. I'm just explaining things away. So you're really just destroying others' trust in you. So deceit is always destructive. And then the third one, there's also oppression. Or it can be, can be translated violence there. And again, this fits right in with the arrogant and self-righteous person, especially when they have power of any kind. Because they will misuse that power to hurt others for their own gain or even worse, just for their own pleasure because it provokes their, sorry, it provoke, it proves their superiority, you know. If they can put someone else down, it proves that they're superior. And so again, it makes it justifiable in their own warped minds. And fourthly, there's mischief. Of course, it can be translated as just trouble or, you know, hard things. Because selfish people put themselves first, they leave damage and trouble in their wake. It's because putting yourself first is always at the expense of everyone else. That's just how it works. It's natural. So let's each of us look at the trail behind, behind us. If there's heaps of trouble and hurt people, not just one or two, but if there's a, a trend there, perhaps it's time to re-evaluate, re-evaluate what we're really on about if, if we keep causing trouble. And finally, there's iniquity. Or I prefer the word depravity there. I think it fits better. And again, this is a symptom of selfish living because these kinds of people live for their own pleasure and glory. So in order to get them, they go down all kinds of paths and that are sinful and immoral to get that um, pleasure and glory that they seek. So, it's, so that de- depraves you. And worse, they often like to take others with them. So there are... Just now, I've just shown you those few evidences for identifying this wrong, selfish, and self glorifying attitude when it occurs. And if those things are in us, we need to you know, pray to get those things out of us. So, how does the psalmist rebut this kind of thinking? So, remember, this is explaining what the bad looks like, and then he responds to that down in verse 15. He 
It says, Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. So is God going to call everyone to account? Yes, he will. But when the unrepentant sinner has his turn, it's not going to be pretty. But even before that final day before Jesus, David is here calling for God to break his arm. Literally. No, this is like the breaking teeth thing back in, in Psalm 3. Because a person's arm is symbolic of their strength in action. Teeth is symbolic of strength in attack and that kind of thing. It's like animals, but arm is symbolic of strength in action in your works. And of course, you can use that for good or bad, can't you? You can use your arm for good or bad. But in this case, the evil person is doing terrible things like we just read. So when he calls for God to break his arm, what he means is to stop him doing those bad things and stop him putting his hand to evil actions. That's really the, the symbolism there. And I personally think that last part could be better translated because it implies that he's going to reform all the evildoers till they have no sin. That's kind of what you, the impression you get from that last line. But no, not everyone will be reformed, only believers. So it's important to note there that I, there is a grammatical link back to the arm of the first part of the verse, which um, leads me to think it could be better put like this. Expose his wickedness and that arm will not find it. Okay, I've got that there. Yeah. Expose his wickedness and that arm will not find it. In other words, if you show him up for his sin, bring the sin in, into the light, the wicked man is much less likely to try and get away with it. So that's kind of, I think, what that's trying to say there. So that deals with the second one. The third one, the third bad characteristic, which is what we see in verses 8 to 11. And I'm going to call him Mr. Sneaky because he can, thinks he can get away by hiding. So Mr. Sneaky. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He will never see it. Now, there are a million, a million ways to be sneaky. But it all comes down to dishonesty, really, doesn't it? It's when someone deliberately conceals themselves or their motives, but then suddenly you see what they're really on about once they spring their trap and reveal their true motives. And there are loads of people who have been damaged by this kind of behaviour. So we need to be honest and open about how we deal with people, when we deal with people. Truth and honesty. Don't shy away if you need to have the hard talk. Just because it's uncomfortable. Going on in the shadows just makes things worse. You know, think about the kind of things that grow in dark places. Little animals that crawl around. It's just it's that, that kind of picture. If we put, bring things into the light... Those kind of little creepy crawlies go away. And of course, this does make me think of something else that's pretty topical and will be especially for the next couple of months leading up to the election. That's giving evasive answers. I've got to tell you, it drives me crazy <laughs> when you hear politicians. <laughs> you know, they hear the question, they nod and they say, that's an excellent question. And then they proceed to completely ignore it or just talk about what they want to talk about. It's just irritating because I actually want to hear what they say about that question they just got asked. But you know, they take off on a tangent instead. Now I do realise that's considered a bit of an art form and they, teach, they show each other how to do that. It's, it's all taught in the game called politics. But I don't think that makes it any, any less wrong. If you don't have an answer or you aren't prepared to comment, just say that. Okay, so I'm not going to comment on that at the moment or I'm not actually sure or I need to do more research. Or it's just something. Don't avoid it. And I think we'd have a lot more respect for politicians if they even just did that one thing differently. So yes, true Christianity is not secretive or sneaky. And if you're part of a version that is, run away very quickly. That's probably not for the people in this room. but anyway. um, Now, God is very open about the truth. Now, I've shown these cartoons before. It was quite a while ago, so most of you probably haven't seen these. But there's a comparison about false religions how they started and Christianity so this is the first one how other religions started so you have uh, private dream about God sorry it's a bit hard to read 
or a private angelic encounter about God or private idea about God and one person told everyone what he saw. So I'm thinking Mormonism and that kind of thing, that's how that all started. And there's lots of things like that and and Islam started like that too. But how Christianity started, after a public ministry, Christ was killed publicly. Christ rose from a public tomb publicly. Christ publicly showed himself to the public. The public told everyone what they saw. So at least 500 saw him raised, raised again. So Christianity is a very open and public religion. It's, it's all before you. So we need to be careful of any form of Christianity or any secret society. There's skull and bones, there's Freemasons. They all have secretive elements and I don't think that's a helpful way to go about things. It's always linked to a hierarchical arrangement where there's some in the know and some aren't. That always leads to pride and mis- mistrust. That's the opposite of the gospel. So let's stay away from those kinds of organisations. Okay, so how does the psalmist counter this kind of sneaky thinking? By reminding us that God sees everything. Verse 14, But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You've been a helper of the fatherless. So God's eyes are everywhere. And no matter how sneaky someone is, they will not get away with it in the end. God will take it in his hands and deal with it. It's like everything will be broadcast on a giant TV, as far as God's concerned. You know, there's no, no hiding, there's no secrets. And all those who saw themselves as superior, also all those they saw them, themselves superior to, so those helpless and fatherless people who they oppressed, they will actually be the ones who get the mercy from God in Jesus Christ. So yes, forthrightness and honesty are good things. We need to work at being more like that. Now we get to the final bad characteristic and one that says, I'm the boss. Verses 12 and 13. It's more verse 13, but I'll explain that in a sec. Verse 12. Arise, O Lord, O O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? So the idea here is that this evil person doesn't think God has the right to judge or that he will just never get around to it. So this guy basically figures he can be his own boss and is only answerable to himself. And really the the psalmist's response to this kind of attitude started in the verse before, in verse 12 there, because this kind of jerk is getting away with murder and oppressing the weak and the poor and so David was again calling for God to act. So basically, to basically show that he is indeed the ultimate authority, just to demonstrate that truth, to put this upstart guy back in his place. And he also talks about that back in the verse we looked at before in verse 16, about God being king forever and ever. So that verse 16 applied to a couple of things back further up in the passage, in other words. There is no time when humans, other than Jesus, the rightful king, should ever think they're superior to God. Sorry, and Jesus doesn't think he's superior to God. He realises his place too, but he is God. To think you're superior to God is not just wrong, it's wicked thinking. It's dam- damnable thinking. It's Satan's attitude, so we need to stay away from it. No, God is God. All right, so we started out this psalm with questioning, but now we've got through the ways of the wicked, and more importantly, how God deals with that wickedness, and we've got to a better place. And so the psalm finishes with reassurance for the poor and suffering in verses 17 and 18, or more specifically, the poor and suffering believer. This is what it says in verse 17. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. And don't we long for that day. When all things are put right, man will strike terror no more. And in the world we're living in, that's all the more comforting. And it is Jesus who will bring that day. So let's keep looking up. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you will bring that day, Lord, when terrorizing terrorism, the fear of humans will no longer be relevant. You'll be in charge. 
in every aspect. And we thank you, Lord, that you've promised us that and you're bringing that about in your own time, in your own way. Even if, like David, we're a little bit confused sometimes about how that's going, thank you that we can trust you and you've shown you are faithful. So we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.